Hi everyone, welcome to our health talk. We're gonna give it just about another minute as we wait for people to come in. So we'll start going in just a second. All right, so for the sake of time, we have lots of great speakers today, so we're going to get started. So, hi everyone, thank you for joining us today. I'm Maureen McCoy. I will be moderating today's CHS Health Talk on food and nutrition during COVID-19. So we have four great speakers today. We have so many great things to say. We just had to put it all into one, one talk. So we're going to start with Chef Kent who's a certified dietary manager and our instructional coordinator of the ASU Kitchen Cafe, who will be discussing cooking and food safety, both at home and in the restaurants as you start to head into the world, potentially. Um, then we're gonna move to Megan Niskern, who's one of our nutrition faculty and a registered dietitian. Um, also, she has a eating disorder specialist certification and she's gonna be discussing eating for emotional health as we know, people may be struggling with that. Then we're gonna to move to Chrissy Barth, who's another one of our nutrition faculty, also a registered dietitian. And Chrissy will be discussing nutrition and immune function to keep you all healthy. Um, and then we're gonna end with Jessica Lehman, one of our nutrition faculty and registered dietitians, who's gonna discuss nutrition misinformation, as I'm sure you all have seen during COVID. And then at the end, we're going to end with Q&A. So if you do have questions, put them into the Q&A instead of into the chat function. And then I'll be moderating those and then I'll send those out to the speakers at the end and we'll have the last 10 to 15 minutes with Q&A. So with that, I think we're ready to start. So Chef Kent, if you want to take it away. No problem. Well, we have some good news. While everyone's freaking out and upset with coronavirus, um, we have great news. So far, food appears to be safe. Um, Zach, can we go to my first slide, please? So as far as we can tell, uh, neither the FDA or the European Food Safety Authority have found any links between food and infection. Now that's not saying it's impossible. It is definitely possible to spread a virus by food but so far we have not 100% confirmed that. So it looks like food is pretty safe. Um, and some of the reasons for that is, is that our food chains are just really good in this country. A lot of the country was called unprepared for this virus, but our food chains have been preparing for viruses for years. We know how to control them. We have it locked down. Um, we can tell exactly where a piece of lettuce comes from, what field it's in, exactly what farm a cow comes from. We have built safety into our food chains. So we were prepared for a virus coming through. So we feel pretty good about saying that food is safe to eat. The next factor is that it appears that coronavirus really does prefer a live host. It doesn't really like to live on plastic or packing materials or things like that. It can, but it's definitely not its preferred medium. Um, so this is kind of my epidemiology part of the talk. I know it's a little bit boring, but I find it super exciting. Um, I don't want to surprise anyone, but there's bacteria and viruses everywhere, okay? So coronavirus has to compete with all the other bacteria, all the other viruses. It does really well once it gets inside a host, but it just doesn't seem to live very well out just on its own. So a lot of our food production is no touch, like humans aren't really touching the food. If they do, there's always a sanitation phase in it. So the real issue is from that packing material, the plastic, 
And it looks so far that coronavirus just doesn't like to spread that way. Um, the other reason food appears safe is that there's just a limited phase where the coronavirus can really get into our system. It typically attacks the respiratory system, our lungs. So when we're eating food, there's just a very limited window where it can really get into our lungs when we're eating it. Um, it appears that once it gets into our stomach, stomach acid seems to kill it very, very well. And if by some chance it does pass through our stomach, there's just no way for it to get from our digestive system back into our respiratory system. There's no path for that, for the virus within our system. So even if you do eat contaminated food, once you actually eat it, it's, it's not contagious for us anymore. Um, and the last awesome thing about food is most food has a kill phase. Well, there's not been any really strong studies yet because all this information is just so new, but coronavirus tends to act a lot like the SARS virus. It dies at 155 degrees uh, for 15 seconds. So in the real world, it's like medium well. Um, if you eat your food medium well or above, that is going to kill the virus. Um, now that could change in a couple months, but that seems to totally um, have a logarithmic reduction in um, that bacteria. So that's the good news. We're, we're not all gonna die from eating food. Um, Zach, next slide, please. Now, I know restaurants opened up last Friday. Um, I was super excited to actually go out because I love eating food. Um, but I want to give you a few precautions when you went out. Um, I guess the biggest issue that everyone having is there's just so many guidelines. There's no hard and fast rules. Um, the CDC has put out guidelines. Uh, the Nas National Restaurant Association has put out guidelines. Our governor has put out guidelines and they can be all kind of confusing. Oh, for the rest of the talk, if I say NRA, that's National Restaurant Association. The gun people don't care about what your food is. Um, so there's all these guidelines and they are super confusing, but basically they're just gonna be the FDA food code amped up a little bit and with special accounts for social distancing. Um, what that means in restaurants is everyone just can be spaced out a little bit more. For our restaurants, it's just based on social distancing. Um, some places like California, they're doing on room occupancy and Arizona decided not to do that. So it's just gonna be about space in the restaurant, not a certain percentage of people filled up. Um, so that's kind of what you're gonna look for a little bit for our restaurants. Next slide, Mr. Zach. Okay. Next, I'm gonna talk a little bit about PPE. So I think people get a false sense of security when they see uh, PPE out there. I'm gonna tell you right now, there's good, bad, and ugly about PPE. Just because someone wears gloves does not mean they are safe. Um, washing hands is gonna go a lot farther than just wearing gloves. Um, we have seen so many studies in restaurants that if someone's required to wear gloves, they just put gloves on and they go about their day like normal. And they just never change their gloves. That is a huge problem for us. Um, I would much, much rather see employees washing their hands than just wearing gloves. So don't just think, oh, they're wearing gloves, it's safe. They really need to have hand washing going with those gloves. Uh, like some food you have to wear gloves with and in the kitchen you'll see a lot more glove use. But just because your server's wearing gloves, that, that may actually be a bad thing. So we just want to see hand washing a lot more. The next are masks. Now, masks are only required in Arizona. They are not, you don't have to wear a mask. So it's kind of up to the operator whether they're going to have their employees wear a mask or not. Um, I've seen lots and lots of servers wearing masks. That's fine. I'm going to tell you right now, as a person who's worked in an Arizona kitchen, in the summer, you will probably not going to see a lot of back of the house line workers wearing a mask. Um, those lines get up to 100, 110 degrees. Wearing masks could be very hazardous to the people back there. Now, masks aren't required though. So just because you don't see one wearing a mask, don't think that's a bad thing. Um, it's not required. Um, our NRA does not require it. They are much more focused on, you know, just the health of your employees. 
not letting sick employees work rather than just requiring everyone to wear a mask. So PPE is good, but there are a few problems with it. Um, Zach, if you go on to the next one. Now here's one of my favorite topics, bad restaurants. Um, as someone who cares a lot about food safety, I think there are a lot of bad restaurants out there. A lot of them just don't pay the health code enough attention. Um, I don't always like eating out because some things really, really bother me. Um, when you're going out, here's just some things you should be looking for. First off, it should not look normal. When you walk into a restaurant, things should be different. If everything looks like it was six months ago, I doubt they are doing things properly. Um, first thing you wanna look for is tables should be blocked off. Now for most restaurants, that's not gonna be a problem, but if your favorite restaurant is someone with a lot of boost, that's really gonna hurt their occupancy for their restaurant. Um, boost should always be separated, one open, one closed, one open. Um, tables should be spread apart. Um, there should be six foot of distance in between. So you really should be looking for, I guess, blocked off tables. The next thing I want you to look for is service should be a little slower. Your server should be washing their hands all the time. There should be extra precautions. That's just gonna equal a little bit slower service. Please just give people the benefit of the doubt for the next couple of months and just expect your food to be a little bit slower. You should also see some sanitizer buckets all over the place. Um, they're gonna be little red buckets about that big. Um, we should be sanitizing all the tables every time someone comes through. Um, so you wanna see those around the restaurant. Um, you're required to have sanitize, hand sanitizer in the front of the restaurant. So make sure they have that sanitizer out. That is one of the new guidelines. Um, so really look for that hand sanitizer and the people are actually using it. Everything in the restaurant should be single use. Now that's not too big of a deal, unless you're someone that likes to go to bars. Bars are gonna change a lot of stuff. Um, most garnishes or bar straws are just kind of sitting out. They're not individually wrapped. Um, I would try to avoid things like garnishes in your drink, lemon, lime wedges, things like that. And you know those straws just come thousands in a pack. And the last thing I would look for is some sort of written statement. I wanna see that the restaurant is taking this seriously. They have some sort of guidelines up um, that they're not just being flippant about the whole thing. Next, Zach. And last, I wanted to squeeze this in here a little bit, just cooking at home. Like I said, food appears to be safe, but we still need to take some precautions at home. The most important is to wash your hands. I want you to wash your hands a lot. Make sure your hands are super clean because that's probably where the contamination is gonna come from. Um, then you should always sanitize your counters, your cutter boards. You need to wash all your produce. Hopefully we are all washing our produce, but you should really wash everything because you don't know who was touching that stuff in the store beforehand. Um, I know there's lots of vegetable washes out there, but we've had multiple studies to say running water, cool running water washes just as well as vinegar and water or any of those fancy produce things. Just wash your food just to be extra cautious. Um, cook your food to the right temperature. Remember 155 should kill coronavirus. So make sure you're, you're cooking your food and then just sanitizing and washing all your equipment afterwards. Um, so that's really all the time I have. I'm gonna pass it off to Megan who's gonna help me with my, my stress eating that I'm doing all the time right now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chef. And it's actually just one of the most perfect segues into what I was hoping to talk about, which is essentially, how are we all feeling about all of these changes? So as Chef just went through what's changing external to how we're all existing in our home lives, which is nice because we get to start thinking about food from an, another perspective, which is someone else helping us to make it, who, who on here right now, I can't see your hands, but like is kind of sick of food maybe a little bit at this point, since we are kind of faced with having to make everything and be present with our food so much. So the first thing that I want you to kind of just sit back and consider is what areas of your life have been impacted by COVID-19. So 
you, this might be your job. This might be your health. This might be just your family being at potential risk. Um, this may be a loss of job, a loss of, uh, or a change of where you're working. There are so many things right now that have changed. And I think that once we see that kind of extreme change, we just assume that stuff that was always natural to us will just change right along with it. And that's not always the case as a lot of us are coming to terms with right now. So as I talk about kind of our relationship with food, which is what I'm gonna spend my time doing, I wanna first kind of give a little definition of what a trauma is. So I don't wanna get dramatic and I'm not a therapist. However, it is really important to recognize the extent to which our lives have been shifted and altered and how that impacts our other decisions and our and other things that we do. So trauma is basically defined as an incident that causes physical harm, emotional, sp spiritual, or physiological harm. And so if you think about how your life has changed, and harm doesn't have to mean, like, it doesn't have to be something visible, right? It can be anything that we're having a hard time dealing with. And right now, this can be really impactful in how we make our food choices and how we're feeling in our bodies. So when we hear things like Chef just said, you know, help me with my stress eating, it doesn't just become about feeling like you're eating out of boredom or you're eating out of stress or you're turning to food for comfort. It further kind of permeates into other areas like, oh, how much am I moving my body? And what is my body changing? And how, what does my body look like? And is it different? Um, and so we become really self-critical instead of being compassionate to the fact that we are all as a society, um, kind of a human society really at this point, because it is global in nature, going through a collective trauma. The cool thing is, is we tend to adapt in the moments very well, as you're seeing all of these changes that ASU has done, um, the restaurant industry has done, and in all facets of life. But you need to take time to settle in and see how am I feeling and what's going on with me. And we don't oftentimes do a good inventory. So I want you to think about a few things as I move through here. One, what's changed for you? Two, how have your thoughts and food decisions potentially become a little bit more difficult, right? Um, are you less creative with your food choices? Are you sick of being in the kitchen cooking or preparing something? I got two kiddos at home and a husband. We've been here for however long we've all been here since the beginning. And frankly, I'm done with ideas. I'm looking for inspiration. You know, I, I feel like a lot of the family looks to me like, hey mom, what are we having? And I wanna scream, figure it out yourself at this point. And that's okay. You, you need to be able to recognize where you're sitting in your emotions. Because if you don't do that, you're gonna react sideways and it is gonna turn into that stress eating, right? So if you can identify it, sit with it for a minute and figure out what do I really need right now, then you're gonna feel a lot more in control and in kind of tandem with your body and your needs. Um, I also really wanna uh, address like, what are your thoughts and perceptions about your body at this time? It's important to recognize that for a lot of us who've never really had any kind of issue, struggle, conflict with food, that some of that is coming up here because your routines and your access to things have shifted. The same thing has happened with our level of physical activity and movement in our bodies. The gyms closing, depending on where you're living, the amount of access you have to even being outdoors and moving your body in that capacity. Here in Arizona, it's starting to get really hot again, which also starts to limit some of our ability to do activities that we love outside. Um, so with those changes, how are you working to experience and move your body during this time? So I'm gonna talk through a few of those things. If you can move on to the next slide there for me. Um, and again, it's about not being judgmental. So I want you to be thinking, how does this decision or how does this action help to serve my nutritional well-being? And I'm not saying my wellness here and I am not saying health here because while those are important, health is obviously important. Wellness is a little bit of a modification of the term health, right? I'm talking about well-being. So well-being, if you can read it here, um, well-being includes the presence of positive emotions and moods and the absence of negative emotions um, and satisfaction with life, fulfillment, and positive functioning are a part of it. So it's not simply put, 
oh, I can't believe I've been eating and baking all of this stuff, right? We become really judgmental. Uh, I love all the bread baking. I love all the banana bread making. There's a reason we're doing that right now. We have time. We can do it together. We have more of an ability to be creative and try new recipes. And I love that people are turning to finding a comfort in food. That's okay. To, to expect to always be separating your emotions from your food intake is unrealistic. We are emotional beings and food is pleasurable. It should be pleasurable. We want it to remain pleasurable. So you have to find a balance, again, of stopping and thinking, what emotion am I feeling? What is really happening with me? And how do I satisfy that need? Sometimes, Food is great. Use it, enjoy it, order from that favorite restaurant you haven't had in the last three months and just enjoy the heck out of that meal if that's what you need. Don't be thinking so much about how many calories are in this or how is this going to change or impact my body right now. I want you to be thinking about the greater purpose of who you are and looking at your full person well being. And that often doesn't involve being super restrictive or hard on yourself around your food choices. So we can move to the next slide, please. If strong emotions are coming up for you, that's okay. Or if you're like completely confused by how you're making food decisions or um, what, what you're buying, that's okay. What can you learn and observe about yourself this time, during this time? I'm finding a lot of people are moving to becoming more restrictive. A lot of the people that I'm working with right now during this time individually find that they're like restricting their food intake daily. Um, they're limiting their food choices. They're becoming more worried and anxious and fearful and stressed out about their food and their body and the potential that something might change. We've heard a lot about the potential for weight gain, the COVID-15. I don't know why we always do a 15. It's the freshman 15. It's the COVID-15. It's not the reality for every single person that you are going to gain weight just because your routine has changed. In fact, I've found that I am probably still moving the same amount, just in a much smaller space between getting up and checking out a kid, going and checking out another kid, sitting down, doing a meeting, getting up, going and doing say. You don't really realize necessarily how much you are still doing. So stop with the shoulding. I should be doing this. I should have eaten that. I should go about my life like this and stay more in the present with what is available to you. Okay. So how can we be more in tune with ourselves? I've talked about emotions. I also want to talk about body cues. So for instance, one example I have here is what do you tend to do when you have an urge to go to the bathroom, whether it's to urinate or to have a bowel movement? Most of us, take that pretty seriously and decide that we're going to find a bathroom and we're going to alleviate that problem, right? When we're thirsty, most of the time we start thinking, I would like water, but what other liquid is available to quench my thirst? I want you to feel the same way about hunger. I don't want that to be something that you find yourself afraid of during this time. Your body is going to continue to send you cues. And I tell you, it does know what it needs to do right now. So the things that you can do in those moments when you're starting to feel something coming up for you is to stop and think, am I hungry? Genuinely connect. Am I getting those cues? Is it showing up? Think, when was the last time I ate? I can tell you right now it's 1.30 here. I don't know. I don't know where the whole morning went. And so time has kind of become difficult for me. So if you're used to eating at certain times, you're going to need to shift that or set a timer. Recognize, am I bored? Am I feeling sad or lonely? And again, these emotions don't mean that you don't deserve to eat. They just mean, is that even gonna help you right now? Or do, is something else gonna serve you better? Maybe not food related. Um, also connecting to feelings of fullness. Uh, if you've spent a ton of time cooking a huge meal in the kitchen and that's not normally something you do, the tendency is to wanna sit down and enjoy it to its fullest extent maybe, but just constantly kind of stopping and checking in and honoring those cues of fullness. Um, the other thing I wanna do is make sure that you're connecting with the messages your body is sending you. When we think about health, it has to not just include food and physical activity. It needs to include sleep. It needs to include hydration. It needs to include evaluating your stress and your anxiety and your depression or whatever might be coming up for you because all of those are just as impactful. 
Okay, can you head to the next slide? Because I know my time is coming up here. So what I want you to be thinking, this is something called a food balance spectrum that I've created for the people um, that I tend to work with and that I use with uh, students in some capacities too. The answer when you need to fuel your body, which is every day, multiple times a day, is never to just not eat, okay? Unless you've been giving medical advice or you're preparing for a medical procedure, you should be eating, okay? So what this little um, scale here does is allow you to start thinking about why do I need to eat, right? So on the far right side as you're looking at it, sometimes we need to eat simply for the fact that we are food depleted. We are nutrient and energy depleted. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's your favorite food necessarily. It doesn't mean that you're gonna enjoy it because I don't always love everything I eat. It'd be ideal, granted, that would be a perfect world, but we're not always gonna love everything that we eat. So if you find yourself continuing to struggle with really strong emotions, a poor appetite, maybe you're not noticing hunger cues because emotions are so strong remind yourself that not eating isn't an option. You need to eat if you're food depleted. Maybe you're eating because you're motivated to fuel yourself. Maybe you're finding that you're a little bit more sluggish, a little bit less in tune during meetings. So maybe you need to be eating for fuel, right? Also, we should be eating for nourishment. We wanna make sure that we are taking care of and nourishing all the different avenues of our body, all the different areas that need that through food variety and moderation and balance. We also need to recognize there's food for pleasure. So use it if things are hard right now, if you find things that are hard to get motivated by. Like I said, make something you love. Go or go to, I guess we can now, or order in, you know, from that favorite place, those things that you like. That's okay. It's totally okay. I am giving you permission. And then last but not least, we do use food for coping. And again, using the food for coping can be done in moderation. And assessing that is sometimes what becomes difficult in these moments. Recognize how frequently it's happening and connect with what you might actually be missing and needing. I guarantee it's not always gonna be that you need more food or less food. Sometimes it has nothing to do with food at all, but we just keep going back to the food because we can control it. All right, finishing up because they're gonna move on to the next person. I think I have one more slide or that might be the end of it. Um, and I just wanted to say, perfect, use this time for the better. Practice being present. Practice mindfulness. I know that's tricky, but closing your eyes and doing a body scan and checking in is a really helpful way to see where I'm at right now. There is nothing that you need to do other than what makes sense for you. Avoid the shoulds, all right? Take a look at what messages you're taking in. How much news are you watching? How much are you searching articles that are gonna freak you out? How much are you looking up misinformation as Jessica's gonna talk about at the end? And how can you turn those things into joyful things? Influences that are positive in your life. And I'm talking about social media a lot right now, inadvertently. So make, make sure that the messages that come at you are messages that are helpful for you. And again, emotional eating is okay and normal. If you feel like it is a problem, then you need to seek out help. But right now, this is a new time. So check in and see what you need to be doing to take care of your yourself. I could go on for a million years on this as all of us could, but we're going to transition right now over to Chrissy Barth and she's going to talk a little bit more about our immune systems. Hey, thanks Megan. Okay, so when we think about our immune system or our immune function, we actually can boost our immune system. And one way in doing so is how we're eating. So I'm gonna go over some different anti-inflammatory foods that are gonna help boost your own immune system. So before we jump into the food part, I think it's really important that we address our gut health because our health does begin in the gut. And I know more and more research is coming out supporting this. And so what the gut microbiome is, it is basically comprised of microorganisms that live in our digestive tract. And this consists of bacteria. We've got the good and the bad bacteria. We want more of the good bacteria though. Um, we also, um, the microbiome also has micro microbes, fungi, or fungi, and also viruses. And what's surprisingly is that we are basically 90% bacteria. 
which I think is shocking. So we have, there are a hundred trillion bacteria in and on our bodies, and about 90% of that is found in our large intestine. And we also know that bacterial cells outnumber human cells about 10 to one. And the other important thing you want to keep in mind is that we have about 10,000 species of bacteria in the body and about 1,000 of those species that um, they reside in our gut. And so what's really important about that is that the more varied our diet is, it's so important because then the more varied our gut microbiome is going to be, which is then going to help boost our immune system. And another shocking statistic that I found was that our bacteria weighs about between two and six pounds, which is, I think, quite a substantial amount of bacteria that we have in our, in our um, bodies. Um, next slide, please. And when we think about the good gut bacteria, um, it's really important that we feed that good gut bacteria. So there's a saying that uh, we are what we eat, but it's actually we are what our bacteria eat. And we know that our bacteria, the good bacteria, loves fiber. Um, so we find fiber in a lot of our plant foods. So I always encourage people, speaking as a dietitian, um, I always encourage people to incorporate more plant foods in their, their diets or in their way of eating. So we find these fiber foods found in fruits and vegetables, and you can buy them fresh, frozen, or canned. And one interesting thing about um, fruits and vegetables that are frozen, they're actually um, pretty fresh. They're picked at their peak brightness and then they're flash frozen so they're able to retain all their nu nutrition. Um, we also find fiber in whole grains, so whole grain bread or whole wheat bread, brown rice, whole wheat pasta, quinoa, barley, oats, and also legumes, nuts, and seeds. And so the recommendation for fiber is roughly between 25 to 35 grams a day. The average American most likely gets much less than that, coming in at about 15 grams per day. And what we know is that people that consume a higher amount of fiber foods are at a reduced risk of a variety of different inflammatory diseases and conditions, including obesity, heart disease, and cancer. Next slide. Um, the other important thing that we want to keep in mind is polyphenols and their role in inflammation and gut bacteria. So there seems to be a relationship between inflammation and a healthy gut. So the less inflammation that we have, that leads to a healthier gut. And if we have a healthier gut, we're going to have less inflammation. And one of the key factors in this is polyphenols. So polyphenols are plant-based antioxidant compounds and they're naturally anti-inflammatories. And so what that means is that they fight inflammation and the gut bacteria helps promote polyphenols from being absorbed in our gut, which is really important. And then polyphenols help promote the growth and diversity of having a healthy gut microbiome. And so we find these different polyphenol sources in a variety of plant foods, like I mentioned earlier, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, nuts, beans, and seeds. We also find them in a variety of herbs and spices. And actually, a lot of herbs and spices have more anti inflammatories than fruits and vegetables, shockingly. Um, so we, if, I would say toss the salt shaker sometimes and replace it with all these herbs and spices. So some of these include turmeric, ginger, cinnamon, oregano, and rosemary. And I didn't list garlic on here, but garlic is another um, great um, part to add to your diet. And in particular, I always encourage buying Oh, it's, um, it's a fermented type of garlic. It's called black garlic. And i um, talk more about uh, fermentation coming up in the next slide. But um, the other types of polyphenol sources also include tea, coffee, dark chocolate. I always say the darker, the better, at least 70% cacao content if you can. Red wine in moderation. Now, if you don't drink alcohol, I don't say drink red wine just to get the polyphenol benefits, but um, just know that red wine does offer polyphenols in moderation. So moderation is one drink per, uh, for women up per day and for men up to two, and one serving is five ounces. And then extra virgin olive oil also has a great amount of polyphenols. 
Next slide. Okay, so fer fermented foods are also important for, um, for gut health. So fermented foods may act as natural probiotics. And so basically fermentation is a traditional way of preserving food. So we find some fermented foods in the following categories. So with dairy products, yogurt is a great source as is kefir and kefir is a kind of in between consistency of milk and yogurt. So you can use it in smoothies or drink it by itself. I like to add it to a, make a smoothie out of it and I blend in some frozen fruit with it. And then vegetables. So some of these include sauerkraut, kimchi and pickles. Soy is another um, fermented food, in particular the miso and tempeh, which is a fermented soy. And then others, um, apple cider vinegar is another fermented um, food. What I like to do is you can take about a half to one tablespoon of apple cider vinegar, and then make sure you add it to a good amount of water, roughly about 12 to 16 ounces. Because if you drink the apple cider vinegar by itself, it can burn your esophagus, which you don't want to do. So um, make sure that you do dilute it in water. Next slide. Um, vitamin D, um, I know I've been learning even more about vitamin D and how it's so important, especially during this time with the virus. So vitamin D is actually more like a hormone than it is a vitamin. So every single cell in our body utilizes vitamin D. And what's surprising is that about 42% of the US population is deficient in vitamin D. So if we are deficient in vitamin D, we're going to see that it's going to alter the gut microbiome. And then also we're going to see an increase in inflammation in our guts. And so I always encourage people, if you don't know what your vitamin D level is, it's a simple blood test, get checked. And the, the good or the optimal range for vitamin D um, should be between roughly 50 and 70 nanograms per milliliter. And, um, and I've seen people in the single digits, so it's really important that your vitamin D is optimal. So we get vitamin D from the sun, and what happens then is that our bodies then convert the inactive form of vitamin D to the active form of vitamin D through the kidneys and liver. However, some people, are, they do have a genetic predisposition where their bodies can't adequately convert the inactive form to the active form. Um, we can also find it in food sources such as fatty fish like salmon and tuna, egg yolks, fortified foods like milk, cow's milk, and then dairy alternatives like uh, vitamin D fortified almond milk or coconut milk. Certain cereals have also been added with vitamin D. And then also sunbathed mushrooms. So basically what you would do is you would take um, some mushrooms like um, button mushrooms, put them in your windowsill, and then the mushrooms then are able to absorb the vitamin D from the sun. And then when you eat those mushrooms, your body can absorb vitamin D that way. Um, but again, bottom line is to know what your vitamin D status is. And for many people, they do need to have a supplement too. But you want to be careful because vitamin D is fat soluble. So if you are already at an optimal level or on the upper end of the optimal level, taking a big amount of vitamin D from a supplement can be toxic. So know what your vitamin D level is and then supplement accordingly. Next slide. So in summary, um, it's really important to feed your flora with really good foods. Um, and these include eating a whole foods-based diet that includes good sources of fiber. So striving to eat or consume 25 to 35 grams per day, which is doable, um, providing you're eating a good amount and variety of fruits and vegetables, whole grains, beans, seeds, and nuts. And then also getting in good variety. So experts recommend getting in at least 30 different plant species each week, which sounds like a lot. I would say the typical person probably gets in about half of that. So wherever you're at, try to slowly increase it to the optimal goal of at least 30. Um, eat more fermented foods in your diet. Be careful of the highly processed foods. I'm not a believer in deprivation. I believe all foods can fit. But my motto, what I was encouraged um, to people, is 80% nutrient rich and then 20% the less nutrient rich. 
Um, so we know that too many of the highly processed foods like sugars tend to feed the bad bacteria, which we don't want too much of that. And then I'm also not a big fan of artificial sweeteners. What research is finding is, is that these artificial sweeteners are also negatively impacting our gut microbiome. And so like Michael Pollan said, I love this quote, it's very simple to the point, eat food, not too much and mostly plants. And next slide. And lastly, um, Hippocrates, um, he says very simply that let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. And I really think that's important, especially now with what we're going through, that it's really important to take a good look at our way of eating and try to incorporate more of these nutrient rich foods into our eating plans. So with that, I will pass it off to Jessica and um, she'll be sharing some additional and interesting information. Hi, thanks, Chrissy. So my topic today is talking about how we can make sense about of the news, uh, the information that we're seeing about nutrition during this time. So what is fake news? Uh, you know, typically we've heard that phrase being used to dismiss um, information that's come out the end kind of maybe a not very um, investigative way, but um, to dismiss information that doesn't agree with the um, viewer or reader's uh, position already. But today we're just talking about fake news in the sense that it is misinformation or false or untrue statements about nutrition or food. So you might hear the terms um, misinformation or sometimes disinformation. And so this could be, uh, you know, information about a um, food, a beverage, something, a substance such as a, you know, herb or spice or a dietary supplement that could potentially uh, cure or prevent COVID-19. And really, we don't know enough about the coronavirus and about COVID-19 to be able to say this in a an evidence-based way. So, uh, you know, you'll often see information coming um, to you, I'm sure, through texting, through emailing, from, uh, you know, on social media platforms. If you're on Facebook or Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, uh, YouTube, uh, TikTok, all of these um, platforms don't vet user content before it's uploaded. So there is some good reliable information up there, but there's also unreliable information. And so we really need to slow down and think about what we are reading and viewing and hearing and, um, you know, before we pass it on. Um, so currently there is no scientific evidence that any one particular substance that we can eat is going, you know, is going to be um, effective in preventing or treating um, this disease. And you know, the, the novel coronavirus is new, so it's novel. Um, and every day, scientists and medical experts are learning new information about um, the disease. And so this takes time. Uh, we cannot definitively say that there is um, a cure or any sort of treatment. And if there were, we would be recommending it. Uh, you know, I looked on the Johns Hopkins website this morning and there are over 5 million cases and over 330 deaths globally. So this is, um, we would love to find out if there is something that we could eat or drink that would help to, um, you know, fight off this virus. But as of right now, there is no evidence for this. And so we also need to think about the role of science uh, in this whole process. And um, nutrition is a science. Nutrition recommendations are based on high quality scientific evidence that's gathered from research studies. And this takes time, which we don't have right now. We haven't had enough time. It's been a very recent disease. Um, so science is not magic. Science um, is a process of experimentation. So to do all this trial and error is going to involve uh, you know, two steps forward, potentially one step back. And it, you know, just a constant refining and revising of information as we add to it. Next slide. So I was wondering if any of you had seen any of these claims for these magic, magic bullet cures. Um, I've definitely seen some of them and 
Some of them came to me in texts, even from family members and friends. And I will admit, a couple months ago, I was eagerly passing them on because I really was hopeful. Um, you know that, for example, drinking 15, water every 15 minutes would cure the coronavirus. And it came from a trusted family member. So I figured it was worth passing on. But uh, you know, if you kind of look, look through all these um, different options, you can kind of see maybe a pattern. And, um, and by the way, these are all, uh, there are a lot of healthy and nutrient rich um, things in here, like lemons, turmeric, garlic, hot peppers. These are wonderful. Of course, you know, these things can add to an overall healthy diet and have nutrients, but any one specific item is not going to cure or prevent um, COVID-19. Next slide. And so, um, you know, the potential consequences are very serious. And so if we are, um, you know, following recommendations without evidence, it could lead to, um, you know, deaths such as in Iran, there were 44 people who died of alcohol poisoning, specifically because they were drinking excessive amounts of alcohol trying to fight off the coronavirus. And there are potentially very serious um, symptoms and, um, you know, organ failure, organ damage, coma, um, serious vomiting, diarrhea, all kinds of things can result from unregulated uh, dietary supplements. So it's really important that we not, um, you know, just accept whatever nutrition misinformation we hear without really vetting it. Um, also, if we think that uh, food or a drink is going to cure us or prevent the disease, it could give us a false sense of security. And so people might not go to the doctor or the hospital when they really need to. And then that could delay treatment and lead to um, you know, poor outcomes or death. And then of course, it can be very expensive. So the, uh, the supplement industry here is about $123.8 billion every year. And so there is potentially a big market opportunity for a lot of people who uh, would like to make money off of this, um, this disease. Next slide. So before you click on share, there was supposed to be a stop sign, sorry. Um, so stop, okay, and think. Um, if something is too good to be true, it probably is. And this, of course, is you know a pretty good lesson in life that we should always just keep in mind, right? Um, but in this case, it definitely holds true because you know it would be really nice to know that our favorite drink or dessert or beverage um, could also maybe be a potential cure or um, you know preventative measure, but it probably isn't. Uh, so we need to wait for scientific evidence on that. Um, and this is a really important signal here. So when you read something, whether it's in a text from a family member or something that you just see on Twitter or Facebook or Instagram, um, you know, really consider, check in with yourself on how it makes you feel. So if what you're reading has elicited a really strong emotion, that is a sign that this is nutrition misinformation. So, you know, right now this is a really emotional time for many of us and, you know, we're feeling a lot of uncertainty, despair, <laughs> frustration, um, we're grieving, we're, um, you know, we want hope. So we're kind of easily um, manipulated more so than usual. And so we really need to think about, um, you know, if we're, if, if we're being manipulated by, by what we're reading. So um, definitely check in with yourself and make sure that you can monitor how you're feeling as you're reading news or information that's masquerading as news. Um, and how reliable is the source? This is very important. And um, I'll give some helpful links later on, um, tools that you can use to check out your sources. Um, and be skeptical. This is something that is just so important as a consumer of news and just kind of an important media literacy skill, but don't assume that what you're reading is definitely true. So remember, right now there is no scientific evidence that there's anything that we can you know, can eat and drink to cure or prevent COVID-19. So really be skeptical. And then also look for sensationalized news or sensationalized um, words. And so I've included a list here of some of these buzzwords, um, you know, natural is not a regulated term, anything that really um, kind of, you know, again, 
elicit strong emotions, um, you know, detox and miracle, secret, magic, um, things that cleanse or flush, really watch out because it's probably um, misinformation. Next slide. So here are some links um, and we'll make this available to you later. Some of these are really great websites that provide excellent information. And the WHO, the World Health Organization and the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control are our best sources right now for reliable health information. So they, there are thousands of scientists, researchers, epidemiologists, infectious disease specialists who are all working together on solutions and um, we need to make sure that we are staying um, aware of what their recommendations are. And so there's some great pages that they, or websites that they have um, just recently put up um, responding to myths out there. So it's a good, it's a, uh, the first two links are um, great places to go if you want to debunk some nutrition myths or food cures or whatever you see in that, um, whatever you see out there. Uh, the FDA health fraud scam website is also very useful because they will put up um, uh, descriptions and pretty long descriptions actually of any fraudulent um, um, incidents that happen and products to be to be aware of. Uh, there are some fact checking websites here that are excellent resources for uh, you know not just nutrition related misinformation but also other types of health inf uh, information and misinformation and then just information in general that's good for you to have. Um, these are independent fact checking networks that really um, their, their goal is to really um, uphold ethical standards in journalism. And um, the last two are also excellent. They do look at media bias and um, I think it's very important to check out your sources. Um, so the media bias fact check is very interesting because it looks at different sources and puts them on a spectrum, um, not just politically, but also uh, kind of rates them on how much they rely on conspiracy theories and pseudoscience or quackery. And so please avoid sources of information about health um, and nutrition um, and in general, <laughs> uh, you know, that rely on conspiracy theories and uh, pseudoscience or quackery. Um, and then the Ad Advantis uh, media bias rating sites, you, you may have seen this actually, I think it's been kind of out there a little bit, but um, it rates media sources, not just on bias, but very interestingly on how much they rely on news versus opinion content. And so as you might expect, the Weather Channel is rated very highly on news and not so much on opinion, which is a good thing and that's what we would like to see. Um, but when we look at reliable sources, we also want them to acknowledge that they are um, you know, relying on some opinion content and not try to disguise it, not try to disguise their editorializing as news. So that's what we wanna see is just um, you know, disclosures about the type of content they're using. Next. And here are some trusted sources of information about nutrition. So I have the WHO and the CDC up there, and of course the Arizona Department of Health or any other state health ag agencies. Um, so you may be tuning in from a different state. Uh, and the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, which is the largest professional organization of registered dietitians who are the food and nutrition experts. Um, they have great information and it's always gonna be evidence-based. And then of course, this is an excellent website. This is the NIH's or National Institutes of Health uh, National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health website. I love this website because it has lots of great information about dietary supplements and it tells you a lot about um, you know, the, the research that exists, um, emerging research and really how to interpret it. But this particular site is about knowing the science. And so there's a lot of great videos and descriptions of um, the scientific process. And so I encourage you to, to take a look at that too. Next slide. So in essence, um, you know, please stop before you share. Think about, um, you know, whether you're reading information that's, um, you know, scientifically supported or misinformation. And, you know, right now we don't have um, scientific evidence about food and nutrition, uh, you know, specific uh, treatments or cures. But in the next few months and years, 
you know, we will see more emerging research. And so it's going to be important for you to be able to distinguish between high quality evidence and, um, you know, less high quality evidence. And so before you pass anything on, just take a moment to check out the source, um, see if there's better information out there. And, um, you know, you don't have to share everything that you see. It's perfectly okay to just not share something until you can make sure that it's, um, you know, that you vetted it and that you would put your personal reputation on the line. So um, I hope that this has been helpful and um, let me know if you have any questions in the Q&As. Thank you all so much. That was fantastic. Such a nice variety of information. Um, so we have a few minutes, about six minutes for Q&A. So I'm going to jump to the ones that are in our box here. So the first question we'll give to you, Chef Kent. Um, so we had a question about what about the cuts to factory farming regulations? And I've been looking at that question the entire talk, and it <laughs> is a super politically weighted conversation. And I feel like that could be at another 45 minute health solutions talk. Yep. Um, there have been some cuts to farming regulation, um, and I don't want to get too in-depth to it. Um, for this subject, I just want to know that like, our, our food chains are very, very safe. I don't want people to be scared of food chains. And I remember, remind people that consumers do um, drive um, these regulations almost as much as the government does. Like me personally, I, I mean, I don't go out to the fields, but I do verify that all my food is coming from good sources. Um, I, that's something that's important to me. I think that's something that's very important to farmers. Um, and here in Arizona, we're super familiar with Shamrock Foods. Um, they do lots and lots of dairy in our state. Um, and they're a good example. Their regulations are much, much stricter than the government regulations. They put in higher levels of SOPs then you know they're they're getting from the government, um, so I know I'm kind of dancing around that question a little bit, um, but I want people to know that they are safe um, with factory farming and stuff like that. Yeah, no, that's great. It it, it is very political. I I follow the political morning agriculture, and they have daily kind of information that's coming out about all the different changes and regulations and things. While you're still on, Chef Kent, another question. So what about asymptomatic restaurant workers who aren't wearing masks? Isn't this an additional risk to customers and coworkers? Um, it, it definitely is. Um, as restaurateurs, um, I, I inter before I came to this, I interviewed um, a restaurateur, Kendra, who has CK's uh, Brewery or CK's Bar in Ahwatukee. Um, and they're doing everything they can. Testing still isn't super available for everyone. Hopefully we'll get to the point where we can test people before they come back to work. But I mean, as of last Friday, we just weren't there. Um, what a lot of restaurants tours were doing is they are taking temperatures of their employees, proper restaurants. They have good sick leave policies in place to try to keep employees that could have come into contact away. Um, so it, like we don't have strong regulations in place, but a lot of our, our I guess our, rec, our I guess like it, restaurants, they rely on the public and social media. Um, I'm sure everyone saw the bar in Tempe that was packed on that first Saturday yep. and they got a lot of negative attention. Restauranteurs, they do not want that negative attention. Um, they want good stuff coming in about them. Um, they do not want a food outbreak from their restaurant. So they are doing everything they can to avoid that as much as possible. Um, but of course, until we have widespread testing for everyone, asymptomatic carriers are going to be a potential problem. No, that's great. And like you said, like looking at what the restaurant is posted for what they are doing, and a, a lot of them are posting that. So that's great to look at as well. Okay, thank you, Chef Ken. Question for Megan from one of our recent graduates. Um, so could you clarify the difference between eating for fuel versus nourishment? Yeah, absolutely. So we looked at food depleted, right? Which means I just need to eat because I know I have to eat and I'm, I just need to do it. So then when we look at food for fuel, we recognize being in a state 
that requires energy to continue to function. So that doesn't necessarily mean that we have an intention that we're nourishing our body because you do have to kind of want to be nourishing your body when you make food choices. That's how we create variety and um, adequacy, right? So you might not be getting a good variety when you make the decision to have food as fuel. You might just be doing whatever you can. But when you start making food decisions for nourishment, you're thinking more, okay, am I getting some fat, some protein, some grains here? Am I getting a little bit more of a variety? So there's a lot more of an intentional consideration when we're doing nourishment versus when we're just fueling it and we're making sure that we're just getting by. And those are, again, both okay. It's just recognizing what you're motivated by and recognizing that not eating is just not the option. So how do you get to a place of knowing you need to eat and make that decision? I hope that helps clarify. No, that's a great, great distinction. I know that we're coming up on two o'clock. We'll go a little bit over just to answer a few more questions if you can stay on. But if you're dropping off at two o'clock, um, I just want to let you know that this talk will be available on asuhealthtalks.com. And we do have upcoming talks coming up throughout the summer. So you can also check that same page to see what those upcoming topics will be. So we know you're not going anywhere this summer. So stay engaged, keep learning. All right, so we're gonna jump back to another question for Chrissy. Um, so one of our attendees was just asking if you could clarify again your comment on the artificial sweeteners and what was bad about them. And um, if you could also include stevia in your uh, answer. Sure. Um, well, with artificial sweeteners, I mean, basically what they are are is or are artificial. And so what researchers are finding is that these artificial sweeteners aren't able to be fully digested. And so what they're finding out is that they disrupt the gut bacteria, which is called dysbiosis. So when we have an imbalance of our gut, the gut bacteria, the good and the bad bacteria, and in addition, regarding that, is that it actually, certain types of bad bacteria can actually increase our risk of arthritis, which is, um, well, yeah, arthritis, type 2 diabetes, um, even cancers or certain types of cancers. So with anything, typically my personal motto, even as a dietitian, I always say, choose the real stuff, but just, you know, moderate how much you eat of it. So I'm actually a proponent of like real sugar. Um, if you do like your artificial sweeteners, I would say just be more aware of how much you're using. Um, I had a client years ago where he was type two diabetic and he would go to Starbucks every morning and he would buy his um, large venti Americano and put in like 20 pumps of sugar-free vanilla and like 10 or 20 packets of one of the artificial sweeteners and that's just too much. So moderate how much you use. And then with stevia, stevia is, is natural. It's actually from a South American plant, but it is a newer type of sugar. So I would just say still moderate it. Some people overdo it. So one or two packets a day, I think is perfectly fine. Just be more aware of how much you are using. Great. Um, someone asked also about honey as a sweetener. Sure. I, I personally like honey. I think there are, there are some really great microbial um, properties to honey, but just know that honey is still sugar. So, you know, just be more aware of how much you're putting in your tea or on your toast. But in moderation, I think honey is great. Okay. And then regarding vitamin D, how often should we check by blood exam after starting it as a supplement? Sure. Good question. And I always would refer that you talk to your healthcare professional, your, your doctor with that question. But usually I recommend, it depends on how deficient you are, if you are deficient. I usually say like every three months or so, maybe every three to six months, but always refer to your doctor too to get his or her input. Awesome. And then one more question for fiber and fruit. Will dried fruit work as well? Sure, dried fruit. Mm -hmm. Sorry, say it again. I think I talked over you. Go ahead, Chrissy. Sorry. Yep. Fiber is great. I mean, um, dry fruit is great. When it comes to serving size, just know that one serving of fruit is equal to like one small apple 
or um, about a quarter cup of dry fruit. So you are getting, I mean, dry fruit gets a bad rap because it does have more sugar, but if you're matching the portion size, it's actually the same amount of sugar. So a quarter cup of dry fruit is equal to one small banana is equal to one serving, like one apple, and it's a great source of fiber too. Perfect. Um, and then Chef Kent had a great question for Chrissy. As we are enjoying our potential wine drinking, um, is there a difference between the different red wines? If we're choosing a red wine, is there a best one to choose? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Um, I mean, just like, just thinking about it, I would say the darker, the better. Um, so I don't know a hundred percent sure. I, mean, I can definitely do some research and get back to you, Chef Kent. Um, but I would think the darker the red wine, the better. And the, the metabolic health team did a great happy hour a few weeks ago that Corey and Dorothy led in terms of, um, they were talking about fermented foods and then we were talking about the different types of alcohol. So I would encourage everyone to, to listen to that if it's available. Um, I think those are, our, those are our big questions. So thank you all again so much for attending today. Thanks for staying on a few minutes later and we will see you at the next ASU Health Talk. So asuhealthtalks.com. Thank you all so much.